How many ready for the word today? Pretty wild that three years ago we were in a coffee shop on the south side and uh, this morning we're in the convention center. Come on, turn to your neighbor and say, look what the Lord has done. Come on, turn to someone else and say, I told you so. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to 2 Kings, 2 Kings chapter 5. 2 Kings chapter 5. Beginning in verse 1. It says, the king of Aram had a great admiration for Naaman, the commander of his army, because through him the Lord had given Aram great victories. But Naaman was a mighty warrior. He suffered with leprosy. At the time, the Armenian raiders had invaded the land of Israel. Among their captives was a young girl who had been given to Naaman's wife as a mate. One day, the girl said to her mistress, I wish my master would go see the prophet in Samaria, speaking of Elisha. He would heal him of leprosy. So Naam went to the king uh, and told him what the young girl had said. Verse five, go visit the prophet. The king of Aram told him, I will send a letter of introduction for you to take to the king of Israel. So Naaman stretched or started out carrying the gifts, 750 pounds of silver, 100 pounds of gold, and 10 sets of clothing. Verse six, the letter of the king of Israel, with this letter, I present my sermon, Naaman. I want you to heal him of leprosy. Verse seven, when the king of Israel read the letter, he tore his clothes and said, am I a God that can give life and take it away? Why is this man asking me, me to heal someone with leprosy? I can see he's just trying to pick a fight with me. But when Elisha, the man of God, heard the king of Israel had torn his clothes in dismay, he sent a messenger to him and said, why are you so upset? Send Naaman to me. He will learn that there is a true prophet in Israel. So Naaman went with his horses and chariots and waited at the door of Elisha's house. But Elisha sent a messenger out to him. Go wash yourself in the Jordan seven times and your skin will be restored and healed of your leprosy. Verse 11. But Naaman became angry and stalked away. I thought certainly he would come out to meet me. I expected him to wave his hand over the leprosy and call upon the name of the Lord and heal me. Verse 12, aren't the rivers of Damascus, Abana, and Farpar more better than the rivers of Israel? Why shouldn't I wash in them and be healed? So Naaman turned away in rage. Someone say rage. But his officers tried to reason with him. Sir, if the prophet would have told you to do something difficult or hard, someone say hard, wouldn't you have done it? So you certainly should obey him when he says something simply, someone say easy, as go wash yourself and be cured. Last verse. So Naaman went down to the Jordan River, dipped seven times as the man of God instructed him. And his skin became as healthy as the skin of a young child. And he was healed. I came here to tell you that hard things become easy in the presence of God. The title of this message is easy in the presence. Let's pray. So Lord, we declare like we have put on stickers all over this convention center. We declare that we do not make room for you. We give you the whole room. Like we sang tonight or this morning, Lord, you are why we came. You told us to come here. So here we are. And we just came to meet you. Not a band, not a minister, not a performer. We came for you. Come on, pray with me, church. So we declare today, Father, I pray right now that you would breathe upon your Logos word. I pray you would become alive. Holy Spirit, I pray that you would speak to us. I pray that you would give us ears to hear, hearts to receive what your mind is saying. Father, I pray right now that your word is true and that every man's a liar. We declare your word is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. Come on, pray with me, church. Now we pray no spirit, but the Holy Spirit is welcome in this place. We say spirit of fear, you have to go. We say spirit of religion, you have to go. I pray every spirit of death and destruction, you have to go. Father, I pray, Holy Spirit, you are welcome in this place. We say, Father, have your way today. Father, I thank you that nobody came to hear me. We all came to hear you. So we say, speak, Lord. Your servant's listening. And all God's people said, amen. amen. 
and amen. Come on, you can give God a better hand than that. I want to talk about this concept. You might want to call it a, a, a spiritual philosophy that we have picked up along the way that Following Jesus, encountering Jesus, a relationship with Jesus, spiritual things have to be hard. It's a philosophy that we've partnered with. And I grew up in a Christian home. I grew up in a pastor's home. And I grew up thinking that ministry was the hardest job on the planet. Do you know why I thought that ministry was the hardest job on the planet? Because that's what everybody told me. And maybe they have told you, man, being a Christian is so hard. Oh man, hearing God is so hard. Man, following Jesus is so hard. Man, it's so difficult to do. In fact, we've sang songs about it. Like, like, like nobody told me the road would be easy. And we say all of these things and we believe these concepts and these lies that an encounter with Jesus has to be hard. Pastor Les Cody pastors our, Pastor Les and Pastor Nikki uh, pastor our Waco campus. And when they were doing, come on, give me a hand if you love them. And when they were starting out their, their team nights and, and, and building the church, some random person came that evening and, and said, Pastor Les, can I pray for you? And he said, sure, he's just being nice and kind. And, and, and she started praying, she started praying, Lord, I pray you make it so hard that they know it's you. And he stopped and he grabbed her hands and he said, no ma'am. Don't let somebody prophesy over you. Don't let somebody convince you. Don't let someone speak that over you. Don't let someone name your ministry, name your family, name your church. Why? This is something that has gotten into the culture of who we are. Oh, marriage is so hard. Oh, it's so hard. Oh, the honeymoon's going to be over. Oh, everybody, anyone just recently married or engaged right now? Everybody's, oh, marriage, oh. Oh, it's so much easier just to be in the club on Friday night. It's so much easier. And then you get married and then you have kids. Oh, once you have kids, you'll never sleep again. Oh, it's so hard. Oh, it's this. Oh, it's that. And, and, and it's this concept that's been driven into you. Oh, college is hard. Oh, your ministry's hard. And then we wear it like some dumb badge of honor. Oh, it's my burden. I'm in ministry. I walk, I, I, I'm around pastors a lot, unfortunately. And, 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 and when I'm around, oh, it's so hard. Oh, it's so difficult. Oh, it's, it's, we're just attacked so much. But don't point fingers at pastors. You do it just as much. Some of you are the person that no one wants to ask how they're doing. Because you will trap them in the foyer for 45 minutes and just spiritually vomit all over them. I'm just really going through a desert season. <clears throat> do you know there's no biblical reference for a desert season? No, 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 you partnered with a lie. No, oh, 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 I got a Facebook theologian right now. Oh, they, 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 but they went through the desert, right? 14 day journey. Took them 40 years. Not because it was a desert season, because they chose to partner with a lie that it had to be hard. Oh, Pastor, did, wait, 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 hold, hold on, hold on, because because I, I I I took a class online, and Jesus was in the desert, correct, for forty days. What season have you been through the last forty days? That's not a season. That was an opportunity for promotion. He did what the Israelites couldn't do in 40 years, in 40 days. See, he said, I'm going to conquer what Adam couldn't conquer. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do what you couldn't do. 
there's this concept, a spiritual philosophy. I believe it's a demonic lie. Uh, and then we steward it. Man, I wish we would steward prophetic words as, as much as we do demonic lies. That this has to be hard. Do you know why we know it's a lie? Because God set it up originally to be easy. Let me show you in God's word, Genesis chapter three. Genesis chapter three, beginning. Oh, it's not Genesis three. Where am I at? Verse one. Genesis chapter one, verse 28. There we go. Here we are. And God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion. Someone say dominion over the fish in the sea, over the birds in the heavens and every living thing that moves on the earth. Look at verse 31 though. It says, and God saw everything he made and behold, it was very good. Y'all, everything was easy in the garden. God made it. He blessed it. Watch this. They lived with the animals. The, the land produced. Watch. They talked and walked with, gar, with God in the garden so easy. They lived, watch this, in the presence of God. Do you know that Adam and Eve didn't need clothes in the garden because they were clothed in the glory of the Lord? Watch, they didn't have to provide clothes for themselves. They didn't have to provide food for themselves. They didn't have to provide relationship for themselves. Everything that they needed was in the garden and it was easy. Someone say easy. Everything was easy, watch, until they left the presence of God. You need to hear this today. Everything was easy until they left the presence of God. So why do things get hard? I'm gonna give you three reasons why things become hard. Number one, bad choices make life hard. Heather and I went on a family vacation with our kids we made a decision, hey, let's, let's have all the kids sleep in our bed with us. <laughs> let's have a good old fun family sleepover. <laughs> We're watching a movie and Heather can't watch a movie without four bags of popcorn. And she's double fisting, just left and right, bag over bag. Crumbs are everywhere. Everywhere I poke, I'm getting poked by a corn that, that, that fell down her mouth to her garments. It's like the do a Herman, like the anointing. It just falls all over around. And, 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 and then it's finally time to go to bed and it's fun and it's cute. And all the kids are in their cutest pajamas. It's so cute when they're in their little pajamas with their buckies and all that. And so we're here. That's what we call bottoms in our family, buckies. And, 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 and so we're having this great time. So, okay, it's time to go to bed. We, we say goodnight and we love each other and pray for each other. And then it's my favorite time where we go to sleep. <laughs> I have an anointing for sleeping. I have traveled the world. I can sleep on any plane. I can go to bed any time. My favorite thing to do is nap. You are never more like Jesus than when you're napping. So we're trying to go to bed. And so we put the boys on the floor. And, 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 and my, my 11 year old daughter, Peyton, is, is about as stubborn as her mom. And so she, she's demanding that she sleeps in the bed with us. And, 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 and so finally I give and I relent. And, and so we start falling asleep. And, and she's got the anointing that I have as she, she sleeps really fast. And so she's asleep. And we all go to bed, just all three of us in that bed, just sleeping, nice, nice, nice and vertical, just sleeping. And then all of a sudden around two in the morning, like an American Ninja Warrior, my daughter just starts moving horizontally in the bed, stealing covers, kicking me, elbowing me. I can't go. I can't move. There's nowhere I can turn. I, I feel like I'm in the valley of the shadow of death. I, 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 I'm being tormented. It's like what Paul said. There was thorns in his side. There was a little 11 year old foot in my side. And, and, and I, I put up with it for about an hour. And finally I put it on the floor. And that was great for about another hour until she starts talking in her sleep. 
And about four in the morning, my 11 year old girl starts out loud counting down from 10, 10, nine, eight, seven. I pop up out of bed at six, five, four, three. I'm shaking Heather, what happens at one? Someone to say bad decisions. Bad decisions ruin night's sleep. Bad decisions cost you peace. Bad decisions cost you joy. So many people, oh, the enemy's attacking me. No, 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 no. You're so spiritually immature, he doesn't have to. You're actually, you ever play a sport and someone gets up and you're like, ah, oh, it's okay, guys, just relax. Some of you, that's how the enemy treats you. Yeah, it's okay. They're just going to make the bad choice on their own. You know how many people tell me on my Tuesday Q&A, Pastor, what do I do when my husband is just not the spiritual leader? Like you didn't have a problem when you were dating and he was the physical leader. But now all of a sudden, you need him to spiritually lead when he already showed you he wasn't a spiritual leader. But you made the bad decision to come into covenant with the boy. Huh. And you'd think that some people would learn after the second or third one. You know how many Christians complain about what's happening in our nation, but did not vote for godly values? Oh, I just can't believe they're putting us in this position. I'm so glad my church doesn't talk about politics, separation between church and state. I don't want anyone to be uncomfortable. And it's not, you know, I, I can handle them shutting down our lives, making us suffocate, masking us, shutting down our businesses, inflation through the roof, all these things. I just don't want to make anyone uncomfortable. It's quiet in the convention center. I just believe the Lord is going to just work everything. Romans 13. Romans 13 says it's the job of the governments to do good. So if they stop doing good, do they become the authority that God placed? I don't see one Bible verse that any man of God submitted to a tyrannical, anti-biblical law. You get nervous when I walk from speaker to speaker? <laughs> me too, me too. Lord, protect me, protect me. Our bad choices cost us. Let me give you some practical advice. Just ask God to give you wisdom. You, you need to understand, some of you just need to just stop. If you are in a situation and your life is hard because you didn't change your tires, the enemy just attacked me. No, you went to the airport 45 minutes before your flight left. It's not the enemy. Elbow your neighbor and say, I think he's talking to you. Listen, do you know that you can just begin to ask God for wisdom and he'll be giving it to you? Do you know just because you're good with money doesn't mean you're good at parenting? Do you know it's a bad decision to let your children go to people's houses that you don't know? We were at my daughter's volleyball game and, and, and they were dominating, playing great. And, and, and my son ran by me, my eight-year-old son, and he ran by me and I said, hey, slow down. And he, and he, he looked at me like, ha, we're in front of people. It's like, mm. I pulled him into that basketball gym closet. I said, do you think that you can um, uh, not obey me in front of people? Do you think that's your scapegoat? I said, do you think that will fly? He's like, no. I said, no what? No, sir. Can I just have people that aren't white just partner with me for a second?
We got some white visitors like, I thought we were just supposed to be our child's friend. (laughs) No, you're supposed to raise them in the way they should go so they won't depart from it. Someone say bad choices. But what makes life harder than bad choices is sin. Now, sin is one of those wonderful things that we don't talk about much in church, and that's why the church has lost authority and power and influence in the world. And so the church goal has been to get people to come. Do you know Mercy Culture's goal has never been to get people to come? Do you know we didn't even rent the convention center for you? No, sometimes we get it twisted because we, we, we present everything with excellence or to the best of our ability and we want to create an atmosphere that, 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 that is fun to come into. But, but, but it's not for you. All of this is for him. The motivation is to get what he wants. Hmm. The Lord said he wanted the convention center. So we did what he said. We don't talk about sin because we have a lukewarm, spit you out of your mouth, weak church in America. And the reason why you're seeing happen in America in the natural is because the church has lost authority. You don't talk about sin anymore. Majority of people believe that if they're just good, they go to heaven. In fact, scripture teaches us the opposite, that we can't can't be good enough to go to heaven. So when I say sin, what am I talking about? Sin in the Greek is the word amartia, which means a, a sinful thing or missing the mark. This is what it fundamentally means, that what you are aiming for is the wrong target. Sin is a violation of God's standards, willfully doing what is wrong. Actions that violate the law or the moral standards of God. I'll get to that in a second. It's depravity. It's iniquity. It's transgressions, trespasses, worldliness. I love this definition. Purposeful disobedience. Actions that are contrary to God's will. See, there's a difference between sins that are actions and that a lifestyle that embraces sin. Scripture says all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, every single one of us. But there's a difference between you make a mistake, you repent to the Lord, and then you engage in repentance of turning and going a different direction. And someone that sets their heart to do what is contrary to God's word. Genesis chapter three. This is what happened with Adam and Eve. Their sin made their lives harder. Watch this, verse 18 of Genesis 3. Thorns and thistles shall bring forth for you. You shall eat the plants of the field, but the sweat of your face you shall eat bread till you return to the ground for where you are taken. For you are dust and dust you shall return. Church, I came here to tell you that sin makes your life harder. And sin makes it harder to get in the presence of God. We've talked so much about an unbiblical grace that we do not understand relationship with Jesus. We want to quote scriptures like Jesus, uh, his love never fails and, 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 and nothing will separate us from the love of God. Absolutely 100% true. Nothing will separate you from the love of God, but your sin will separate you from the presence of God. You cannot live in sin and live in intimacy with God at the same time. It's why after you look at pornography, it's hard to get into your word. It's it's, it's why when you go out and get drunk, it's hard to go into the prayer closet the next day. It's like your sin creates almost like a a, a walking or wading in mud where it was once easy to get in the presence of God, but, but because of your sin, it makes it so difficult. The Psalm says it like this. Psalms 42, he lifted me out of the slimy pit, out of the mud or the miry clay. 
and he set my feet upon a rock and gave me a firm place to stand. Your sin is like the mud that keeps you from running in the perfect will of God. Hmm. Sin causes you to leave the presence of God. This is so important you understand this. So many people try to make the conversation about, does God love you? And I wanna make this crystal clear today. God loves you. He sent his son to die for you. Watch, Jesus proved his love for you. I'm not talking about, does God love you? I'm talking about, do you love him? Ah. Have you ever hurt your spouse? Yes. But have you ever really hurt your spouse? And the feeling when you know your actions hurt your spouse and that inner resolve, never do that again because I don't want to hurt the one I love. When you love God, you don't want any of your actions to not be loving towards him. When you love God, everything you do is to please him. Genesis 3, 23 says this, therefore the Lord God set him in front of the garden to work the ground which was taken. Verse 24, please look at this. It says this, he drove out the man from east of the garden. He placed a cherubim of a flaming sword that turned every way to guard the way to the tree of life. This is important. God said this, because you sinned, I'm now gonna have to have you leave the garden or you have to leave my presence. And he put a cherubim or he put an angel with a fiery sword to protect the entrance of the garden. Watch. So they did not have free access back into the presence of God. You need to watch this today. So God created the garden and it was easy. His presence was there. It was so easy to live life in the presence of God. But through bad decisions, through talking with Satan, through entertaining deception, through partnering with sin, they were removed from the presence of God and now life becomes hard. They're removed from the presence of God. Hmm. It says this, Matthew 7, 21. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. This is important. Just like sin wasn't allowed in the garden, sin is not allowed in heaven. Oh. Someone needs to hear this. This will help you break free from, from, from religion, from a, from, from a worldly indoctrination. This will help you. A lot of people say, say ignorant things like, if God's so loving, why does he send people to hell? That's an incorrect statement. God doesn't let sin in heaven. The same way he didn't let it in the garden, he doesn't allow it in heaven. It says, not everyone who says, are you reading this? This is Jesus. It's read in your Bible, Matthew 7, put it up on the screen. Not everyone who says, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father in heaven. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, we prophesied in your name. We cast out devils in your name. We were Christian pop stars. We did mighty works in your name. And then I will declare to them, look at this, I never knew you. Hmm. Watch, we weren't intimate. Ah. Because he's not intimate with you while you're intimate with the world. Church, you cannot be intimate with God and intimate with your sin at the same time. And here's what he goes off and says. He says, now away from me, look at this, you doers of lawlessness. See, Jesus is reflecting the lawlessness, watch, that the law was created to expose. 
So when we talk about the law, a lot of people just think it's the Old Testament. It was a part of the Old Testament. But what was the law? The law was 613 rules on how to be right with God. They were kind enough in Exodus chapter 20 to sum it up to 10 in the 10 commandments. So there was 10 commandments, but 613 laws that kept people, watch this, in right standing with God. How many have a hard time with just the top 10? And sacrifices had to be made for the sin or those that uh, uh, broke the law to cover their sins. So when Adam and Eve left the garden, then God gave humanity his law to keep them in right standing with God because they did obey the one rule of don't touch the tree. So sacrifices would be made. So every year, people would make sacrifices, animal sacrifices, to atone for their sins that they committed. And this is how people stayed in the right standing with God. But here's the problem, church, is no amount of sacrifices was enough because sin was so easy and the law was so hard. And nobody could keep up with the 600 rules, the 600 regulations. No one could do it, watch, except Jesus. So here's what the Bible says, that he was the ultimate sacrifice. John chapter one, verse 29, John the Baptist said, look, there's the lamb of God that was slain. Look, he's the one. So God said this, I have to bring an ultimate sacrifice because no amount of sacrifice will atone for the sins of the world. So Jesus became that ultimate sacrifice. That's why Hebrews 10 verse nine says, then he said, look, I have come to do your will. He cancels the first covenant or the law so that and put the second covenant into effect. Verse 10, for God's will were for us to be made holy by the sacrifice of the body of Jesus Christ once and for all. Someone shout amen. amen. So Jesus became the ultimate sacrifice for our sin. Someone thank him for that. Come on, is anyone here who's fallen short of the glory of God, but he's been so kind and merciful to you? Come on, any in the one in the balcony, thankful for the blood of Jesus? So watch. Sin made it hard. The law was impossible to fulfill. So Jesus came to not abolish the law, but to fulfill the law. So to recap, our bad choices make life hard. Sin makes life hard. Here's the third one that makes it the hardest. Religion makes it the hardest. And I don't know if you are aware that we're in the Bible Belt. We're potentially the greatest stronghold in this region is the spirit of religion. What do I mean by telling you religion? I mean religion, watch, makes it hard to get to God. So where Jesus, watch, made it easy to get to God, religion makes it hard. What is religion? Religion is when you're never good enough. Religion is when you have to do more good works to outdo your bad works. Religion, watch, is when you're not baptized right. Oh, were you baptized in the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit? Was a towel around your waist? Was a white towel? Was it made of wool? Was it lamb's wool? Because if it wasn't lamb's wool, then you're going to hell. Well, how did you get saved? Were you, did, you say, did you say the Lord's Prayer? Or did you say the sinner's prayer or the Lord's Prayer? Which one was it? How, how did you pray? Did you repeat after them? Did you mean it in your heart? Did you say it out loud? Did you believe, could you fess with your mouth? How did you, did you come to the front or did you come to the back? Did you stay in your seat or did you come forward? Because if you didn't come forward... Religion makes it hard. I, I, I'm just trying to do it. I'm trying to do these works. I'm trying to do it right. I'm trying to make it right. I have so many people that are arguing about how you were baptized or you didn't do it right. I don't know. How was the thief on the cross baptized? 
When Jesus looked over and said, today you'll be with me in paradise. Watch. The spirit of religion is trying to make what God says is so easy hard. You know how they make it hard? They tell you the gifts of the Spirit aren't for today. Now, if you were the enemy and you wanted a weak church, and Scripture says church is built on the apostolic and the prophetic, wouldn't you tell everybody that there's no prophets and apostles left? So that they, be, they build churches on teachers that do not have the spiritual strength to build what God wants to build? How would you do it if you were the enemy? If you were the enemy, and this is a spiritual war that Lou Engel so well told us and taught about last night, how would you get people spiritually weak? Ah. Religion makes it hard. You ever get online and you're talking about everything God did for you and what he spoke to you? Sometimes I'll teach on how God speaks and one religious person jumps online and he speaks through his word. Yes. Thank you. You've never commented on anything but to correct me with your religion. Appreciate your ministry. Bet you're fun at Thanksgiving. You're just trying to tell people what God did. They're like, oh, that's not God. Oh, that's emotionalism. Oh, you just made that up. How do you know it's God? How do you know you're speaking in tongues? Did you sound like someone else? Oh, if you sound like someone else, maybe you copied them. All of these things, come on, it happens to everyone. Why? Because there's a spirit of religion trying to talk you out of partnering with the Holy Spirit. But guess what? That spirit of religion, watch, it mimics the religious Pharisees and Sadducees. They hated Jesus. Watch, watch, watch. He never sinned. Is all he did was heal people, love people, feed people. That's all he did. Watch. But he loved who they ostracized, so they hated him. That's all they did was follow him around. Ah, Can you imagine this for a second? He's never sinned. And they're slapping him in the face, mocking him. When he had never done anything wrong. But watch, that spirit of religion, watch, hates that God made it easy. And the purpose of this religion, watch, uh, is to make you partner with a lie that it's so hard, watch, you won't even try. So you don't even try to hear from God because someone said it's too hard. You don't even try to encounter God because you said it's too difficult. We call it quiet time, a punishment, a time out where you go and you're in this little spiritual prison for 20 minutes in the morning. We try to make this thing so difficult and so hard. We've tried to make it, the spirit of religion has tried to make it so difficult that you will not even attempt it. Because what would happen if people started getting in the presence of God. Oh, I say this every single Sunday morning from this pulpit. I say when you get in the presence of God, it's so easy to hear him. Ah. So don't you think there's a strategy of the enemy to keep you from his presence? Sir, I don't know who you are in that yellow jacket. I think you work here, but I feel the presence of the Lord on your life right now. Father, I pray right now that you would bless this man in Jesus' name. I pray he would encounter you like he never has in his entire life. I don't mean to embarrass you. I just feel the love of God all over you. Someone put your hands together and glorify God. Can I teach for a few more minutes? So watch. Genesis 3, 7 says... Adam and Eve's eyes were open. They knew they were naked, so they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves close. Just watch this for a second. God clothed them in his glory, but they physically had to make themselves their own clothes. How hard do you think that was? How much easier was it for God just to clothe them in glory. Can I tell you how hard it was? 
We never thought about this before. It was so difficult for them to do, it didn't work. Right after they made themselves clothes, what did God do? He took an animal sacrifice and God had to reclothe them. Religion is trying to make you in your ability. Trying to clothe what only God can clothe. Watch, and it never works. It never works. Someone needs to get, get free of this right now. On your best day, you're not good enough. Watch, it's not being good enough. It's not being saved enough. It's not being godly enough. Watch, it's being so in love with Jesus that no matter what, I refuse to leave his presence. If someone loves him, just shout at the convention center, I love you, Lord. <laughs> they couldn't clothe themselves. Jesus had to do it. Hmm. Here's what I need to tell you today. Religion doesn't work. It just doesn't work. Hmm. Church, bad choices make life hard. Sin makes life harder. But religion makes it the hardest. So if life is so hard outside the presence of God, church, why wouldn't we stay in the presence of God? Can I say that to you again, just so it sinks in? If life is so hard outside of the presence of God, why wouldn't we just stay in his presence? You know what's wild? I traveled as evangelist for 10 years. And when we started Mercy Culture, we went into this church downtown called Seventh City. And they're amazing. They just let us come for free and use the church. And every time we'd meet, I would get in the presence of God. And I remember the third time we were gathering, I was like, is he gonna come? Is he gonna come? Is he gonna come? And then there we are in the presence of God like we were today. And I realized we could go in the presence of God every service. I just went around for 10 years to churches that didn't really want it. I would experience a few times a year what we encountered every time we gathered as mercy culture. And then it dawned on me, if he's the guest of honor, if the goal is just to be in his presence, watch, it happens every time. Do you know that's what could happen to you in your daily encounter? When the goal is just to be with him. Look at this, Matthew chapter 11, verse 28. Matthew eleven twenty-eight 28 says this, Jesus is speaking. Come on, you need to hear this today. Come to me all who labor and who are heavy laden. I will give you rest. Look at verse 29. My yoke, someone say my, my yoke. Take my yoke upon you. Learn from me. Someone say, learn from me. I am gentle and lowly in heart and you will find rest for your souls. Look at this. My yoke is easy. Would you just say that out loud? Say, my yoke is easy. I feel like this is an important spiritual moment. Someone just shout easy. My burden is light. What is a yoke? A yoke is a wooden bar that's placed over the neck of a pair of animals so they can pull together. Put that up on the, on, on the screen, please. It unites or joins two individuals or two people together to pull an object as one. This is what a yoke is. Watch, a yoke is this wooden beam that will allow two objects, watch, to share the burden or to share the weight. Someone say yoke. But scripture goes on to teach that a yoke is more than just this wooden device that helps animals pull these together. But the, Jew the Jewish people had this concept that it was comparable to a heavy restraint or cattle 
or this heavy burden that would be placed on people. Do you know Bible says that the yoke of sin is heavy? Galatians 5.1 says, for freedom, Christ has set us free to stand firm. Therefore, we do not submit again, look at this, to the yoke of slavery. Scripture teaches us that our sin is like a heavy yoke. Do you know that religion is a heavy yoke? Matthew chapter 23, verse four, Jesus is talking about the Pharisees and he says they tie heavy burdens or yokes that are hard to bear and they lay them on the people's shoulders, but they themselves are not willing to lift a finger. Watch this, Jesus said this, Matthew eleven, twenty-eight. 28, he says, learn from me. Holy Spirit, help me. He says, learn from me. Watch, he's trying to teach us something. <sighs> he's trying to impart something into us. He said, I know you've been told it's hard. I know you've partnered with this spiritual philosophy that life has to be hard. Encountering me has to be hard. Ministry has to be hard. Marriage has to be hard. Parenting has to be hard. But he said, watch, I want to teach you something. Learn how I do it. Then he says this, watch this. He says, my yoke. There's a difference between a yoke of sin, a yoke of slavery, and the yoke of God. Jesus said this, I have a yoke. Now, I remind you, a yoke was simply a wooden beam. Put that next picture up. Jesus had his own yoke. He said, watch, he says, my yoke is easy. My burden is light. Listen, why is his yoke so easy, church? Because he already did the hard stuff. He already carried what you couldn't carry. He already did what Adam could not do. He already did what the children of Israel could not do. The Bible says his yoke is easy. Someone shout easy. Watch what is impossible for us. It's so easy for him. He said, do you know why it's so hard? Because you're not under my yoke. Uh, huh. Do you know when a yoke comes together, it's meant for the two to share the weight? <laughs> Have you ever had a child help you move something? and they were helping. That's what it looks like when you think you're helping God with how good you are, with how hard you're working. Hold on, you need to hear this, you need to hear this because some of you are like me and you love God so much but you are indoctrinated in religion that if you worked hard enough he would love you. If you worked hard enough, it would be easy. And I came to tell you today that it is a lie. It doesn't have to be hard. Watch, because Jesus did the hard part. Church, he did what you couldn't do, what I couldn't do, what Adam could not do, what religion could not do, what the law could not do on its own. Listen, he did the hard part. Uh, and here's what scripture says in Isaiah. It says that he came to break the yoke. I, Isaiah 10, 27, it shall come to pass on that day that his burden shall be taken away from off thy shoulders. Look at this. And the yoke of thy neck. Look at the word of God. It says this. And the yoke shall be destroyed because of the anointing. Watch this. Every single yoke that has been put on your life, whether it's the yoke of sin, the yoke of shame, the yoke of religion. Scripture says this, that his anointing breaks 
breaks the yoke. Here's what I'm telling you today, that you do not have to live under the burdens that you've lived under. You do not have to live under the shame that you've lived under. You don't have to live under the religion that you've lived under because it says his anointing has already broken it. Ah. So if it's so hard out of his presence, why would we not be in his presence? That's why he said, come to me. Watch this. When you come to him, you come underneath the other part of the yoke that he's already carrying. He said, you have to come close. Hear this today. You have to come into my presence. When you come and live in the presence of God, you are living under his yoke. In church, I'm telling you today, it becomes easy. So I want to clarify something right now for the people that are saying, Pastor, are you saying that life is easy? No, I'm saying everything is easy in his presence. No, 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 you need to hear this. Pastor, are you saying that I'm not going to go through trials? No, I'm saying trials are easy in his presence. Pastor, are you saying that I'm not going to go through hardships? No, I'm saying hardships are easy in his presence. Pastor, are you saying I'm not going to go through loss? I'm, no, no, I'm saying loss is easy in his presence. Pastor, are you saying I'm not going to have to go through sickness? No, I'm saying sickness is easy in his presence. Pastor, are you saying that I'm not going to have to go through betrayal? No, I'm saying betrayal is easy in his presence. I'm saying like Paul and Barnabas, like Paul and Silas, no, no matter what you're facing, you've counted all joy when you're persecuted, when you're in prison. I'm saying when you're shipwrecked, you're excited about what God's doing in your life. Or you're like Stephen, as, you're st- as they're stoning you, you have a face of an angel. What I'm telling you is this, church. It's what we sang about today. I'm telling you that everything becomes easy in his presence. I'm telling you this, that he heals on the Sabbath. Even though they accused him of working, he said, it's not work for me. I heal on my day off. He said this, you walk on the water. Watch what we drown in. He walks on. He raises people from the dead. I'm telling you, dead marriages are coming back to life. Dead souls are being re- uh, resurrected right now. Dead dreams are being resurrected right Right now, I'm telling you forgiveness is easy in his presence. When you couldn't do it by yourself, when you tried over and over, you get into his presence, it becomes easy. I'm telling you healing becomes easy in his presence. Deliverance becomes easy in his presence. Everything is easy. I'm telling you, he makes everything. I'm closing with this, 2 Kings chapter 5. It's the story of Naaman. He's a great, mighty warrior. And he has leprosy. It doesn't matter how strong and how gifted he was. There was something that was impossible for him. So, because his king valued him so much, He said, you know what? We're going to send a letter to the king of Israel and get that prophet guy to heal you. He sent him 750 pounds of silver and 150 pounds of gold. I called my friend who who is in this business. I said, how much is all this stuff? He said, about $4 million. He sent him with the $4 million gift and the king tore his robes. He said, how dare him put me in a position to try to heal a man, watch, that no money can buy, watch. The king could not do anything. But Elisha said, you're just the king here. He said, send him to my house. I'll take care of it. He goes to the house and Elijah, Elisha doesn't come to the door. That's the distinct business people to get offended that they didn't get a meeting with the pastor. He doesn't come to the door. He sends his servant with a word. 
Just go dip in the Jordan seven times. And he is furious. He's so mad like you left your last church when they told you to tithe. He said, I'm never going back there. I can't believe this. He knew who I am. We gave $4 million to his ministry. And he didn't even come out and say hi. And he's leaving. But apparently, he's a good warrior because he's rational. Watch. And one servant who feels a kick from the Holy Spirit says, sir, would you just wait for a second? If he told you to do something hard, would you have done it? And he said, of course I would have. Because I've partnered with the belief it has to be hard. He said, how much more since he just told you to do something easy? Should you just partner with what is easy? Church, I came here to tell you, Ryan, start playing. That God wants you just to partner today with what is easy. Lift your hands all over this place. Some of you have partnered your entire life, your entire ministry with things that are hard. You believe the lie. You believe the lie from the pit of the enemy. You believe the lie from the pit of hell that you had to live in the hard place. You had to live in the desert season. You were called to affliction. You were called to trials. And I'm not saying we don't go through those things. I'm saying it's easy in his presence. I'm not saying life isn't hard. I'm saying everything is easy in his presence and it doesn't matter what storm you're in it's easy in his presence it doesn't matter what you're facing it's easy in his presence I don't care what sickness has plagued your body it's easy in his presence I'm telling you that everything is easy with every head bowed and eye close (laughs) Naaman thought the water was going to heal him when it was just obedience that would heal him. Come on, close your eyes all over this place. Lift your hands. Jesus made salvation too easy that a thief on the cross could steal heaven. It's not about you. It's about him. He made it easy for you to get to God. This morning, if you are away from God, if you are living in sin, if you are bound by the weight of life, and you need Jesus, the Savior that made it easy. Jesus said, come to me. So all over this place, even in the highest rafter, I'm not asking you to lift your hands. I'm asking you to get out of your seat and come to this altar if you want to give your life to Jesus. Right now, come fast. This is a big auditorium. Come fast. Just come fast, come fast, come fast, come fast, come fast, come fast. Come on, put your hands together, church. Come on, close your eyes all over this place and just put your hands together. Come fast, come, 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 come. Come on, run to this altar. Come, 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 come. Sing Pastor Jasmine. Come, come, come. You say. there.
every head bowed and every eye closed. If the yoke of sin is heavy on you, if you say, Landon, I've tried and I've tried and I've tried, but I'm still bound by the burden of sin. Y'all, I don't care what it is. He became sin. Do not waste this moment in the presence of God. But if you say, Landon, I need this heaviness to come off my soul. I need this heaviness to come off my heart. I need this heaviness to come off my life. Run to this altar. Don't wait. Don't hesitate. Run to this altar. Run to this altar. Run to this altar.
There was a prophetic word at the beginning of the year that people would be set free from sexual addictions that they've battled for years. Play Malachi. This is the moment. This is the moment. This is the moment. This is the moment. Partner. Ah. I, this is cool. Partner with two prophetic words. The year of expanding territory. And that it would be easy. If you need deliverance from that, run to this altar right now and lift your hands. Staff, church, SLS, pray over everyone with their hands lifted. Run down to this altar. Run down to this altar. I declare, it's easy. 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 It's easy.
lifted. You're partnering with it right now. Say it again. Keep going. I heard the Lord say he's touching people in the balcony now. Risers now. Again. You're not singing. You're praying right now. Now lift your hands all over this place and say, teach me, teach me, teach me, teach me, teach me. <laughs> teach me your mercy, God. <sighs> Here's what I heard the Lord just tell me to tell you all over this place. Just start declaring nothing's too hard for the Lord. Nothing's too hard for the Lord. Nothing's too hard for the Lord. Nothing's too hard to the Lord. Nothing too, say it out loud, say it out loud, say it out. Nothing is too hard. Nothing is too hard. Nothing is too hard. Nothing is too hard. Nothing is impossible. Nothing is impossible. Nothing is too hard. Come on, lift your voice all over this place. Nothing is too hard. Nothing is too hard. Nothing is too hard. I feel faith rising. Nothing is too hard. Nothing is too hard. Nothing is too hard. Come on, about ten times louder. Start to clear. Nothing is too hard. this place and every person that is coming under the yoke of Jesus Christ just pray with me right now say Jesus you're God huh. I feel like you said it over yourself and now we need to say it over the city Say Jesus, Jesus, your God, your God, over Fort Worth, over Fort Worth. Ah, remember when the newspaper said it? Fort Worth is yours. Fort Worth is yours. Say Jesus, Jesus, my faith is in you. My faith is in you. Forgive me, forgive me for everything. Now say, Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, teach me, teach me what you do. What you do. Say, Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, I don't fully understand. I don't fully understand. But I want everything you got for me. I want everything you got for me. 
So speak, Lord. So easy to hear you.